God is the only one which is the source of goodness. So don't give me this title, it's not befitting of me. So when, in, when Christ then tells a young man what to do to get the eternal life by keeping the commandments, the young man responds by saying, Teacher, I have kept these commandments since I was a boy. Very interesting, you've got to note little words here. Notice he drops the title good, simply calls Jesus teacher. Hence he has understood Christ has rebuked me for calling him good because this is a title which is given exclusively to God. So when he redresses him, he makes sure he refers to him as teacher. I have kept this, I have, I have kept this. So even that shows in itself that a young man has understood that in this context, Christ does not want to be given, even given the title of being referred to good because this is a title exclusively to God alone. And as a humble Jew, he realizes that this is a title or any goodness is exclusively from God. So if I'm doing anything good, at the end, the source is God. It's not due to my volition. It's God has empowered me with that, so we give thanks to God. And in that humble context, he makes reference to that. So we see Christ as a Messiah, the anointed one, came to his community, redeemed them, bring them back to worshiping God and God alone. And that is the centrality of the message of Islam. The message of Islam is that there's only one God to whom there is no associates, no partners. He's neither a man, nor a woman, nor an idol, nor a statue. God sends messengers, the final message is the Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace. Thank you for your explanation. Does that, how does it make sense? Does it make sense? It's interesting, uh, the passage you referenced, um, Luke chapter... Mark chapter 10 verse 17. I think it's in Luke's Gospel as well. Yeah. I think Luke and John. And it, yeah, and synoptics, um, yeah. It's interesting, I've always understood that actually on the flip side, that Jesus was saying, was challenging him, saying, what do you mean by this word good? Do you, know why that, do you know why that doesn't make sense? Grammatically speaking, if what you're saying was the case, he would have stated, do you know why you call me good? But note he says, why do you call me good? It would, what your and it's a common response you get from Christians, it's like a rhetorical response. He wants a young man to actually consider who he really is. This is a common, which I think what you're alluding to. But it's not the case, because that would only be the case that if he had said, do you know why you call me good? Given you the opportunity, that man opportunity to reflect. Uh, do you know the reason why? You're, but he doesn't say that. Why are you good? Only God is good alone. And what have we noticed there? According to New Testament scholars, Matthew 19:16. Matthew has such a problem observing Mark's gospel. According to most Christ, um, Christian scholars, the first gospel is Mark's gospel, not Matthew. Although you've got as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So when Mark observes that, he changes the, the, the terms around. He says. Uh, what good deed must I now do to get eternal life rather than why do you call me good? So he changes the words around. Just do a little study of the search of that and he's a professor like John Barton, Oxford University, who was one of the top New Testament and Old Testament professors who make these conclusions. So what we're observing is that in our understanding there seems to be a higher development on the Christology of Christ from Mark, Matthew, Luke and then reaches a somewhat of a crescendo in John's Gospel where all these self proclamatory I am statements become more replete despite the fact uh, that it, uh, historically speaking Christ wouldn't have used those terminologies and hence this is why the synoptics are seen as a very different Gospel to the allegoric for the figurative Gospel of John. But despite that even John's Gospel, you know, it went through like various stages of redaction three different authorships, five different stages of editing. Some were espousing the, the correct view. This is quite something which is very interesting in the Gospel to see. It becomes more and more clear that there are different authors at hand, each espousing their own view. And, this other, and it makes sense. Each Gospel is a portrait, isn't it? Yeah. Given yeah. by individual men. Quite so correct. So the, the idiosyncrasies of each man are going to come through in each of the Gospels. But the portrait that they are giving Jesus, they are doing certain things theologically, I agree, there's more of a Christological focus in John's Gospel. I'm reading through Mark's Gospel at the moment, and it is very interesting, as, as I read it, you go, oh, where is Jesus saying, I am God, I am God? He doesn't. And then actually, in how Mark is presenting the material, he's doing it in such a way as to show what is the identity of this man. Because even within the second chapter, you've got Jesus forgiving the sins of the paralytic. You know, and, the people, and the Pharisees go, no, you can't do that, who can do that with God alone? I shall answer this. Matthew chapter 9 verse 3 in the conjunction with Mark chapter 2 verse 7. Let me tell you something about this. This is unbelievable. CEV version. Christ um, heals a paralytic man and says your sins are forgiven. The Jews look at him and so they say amongst themselves, Jesus must think he is God. Christ who hears their thoughts say, says to them, why do you think such evil things? Meaning you thinking that I am God because I have healed that man is an evil thought. So 
So you're thinking that I'm thinking that I'm God is an evil force. That's a very specific interpretation. But that's a very uh, contextual can, interpretation. It's contextual as well, though. You could say that you're just saying, why, why are the Pharisees more concerned about this man uh, saying forgiveness rather than the paralytic being healed? That doesn't make sense. Do you know why? It's their stubborn hearts that he was going rather than the issue of... No, because you know, so, because it, it doesn't specify it was their stubborn heart. It specifies their thinking. So they're thinking at that time, the, the verse tells us, they say that Jesus must think he is God. So it's to that thought that he makes the re rebuttal or the rebuke, not to the outer dimensions of what you're trying to explain. So it's to that specific thought that he makes the rebuke. Why? So when it's, he must think he is God, to which the response is, why do you think? Because they're thinking that he must think he is God. Why do you think such evil, evil thoughts? thoughts yeah. So hence, you thinking that I'm God is the evil thought. It's just basic plain English. So just like, for you example, say that Jesus would have made it a lot clearer there and then. The uh, best thing to do is just bring out the verse. Yeah, no, I think so it's familiar. Can, yeah, no, it's familiar. But you're, you're using a lot of inference and, in, and placing your no, no, so understanding on that. I don't think Whereas so. You could, I could make an inference on that passage that just goes the complete other way and say that Jesus was challenging them. Yeah. The fact that they had recognised that he had done a divine thing by forgiving So why did he quote Psalms? And he, said, he refers so to himself me, yeah. after that as, I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to give sins. Authority. The Son of Man. But it's not it's by his own volition. He uses throughout the Gospels as a reference to Daniel 7. 7 14. The divine human. It's not in reference. I would dispute that wholeheartedly. I, 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 I would wholeheartedly dispute so that. What's your, what's your retort to that? Yeah. So let's just go step by step because I don't think we want to jump from sure. Daniel chapter 7, verse 14, my March. Let's just deal specifically with this point. Yeah. And I can do it. It's no problem at all because I've got some experience on this. Yeah, so right. in, in, you're saying that it's an inference. No. The context is, in these circumstances, as they say, context is king. So we have to determine what specifically will happen that instant. You're making another inference, but the, the text does not allow you to make that inference. Normally speaking, because to the thought, they're thinking that he must think he is God, and he's specifically addressing their thought. He's not making an inference to the contrary, which is what you're implying. It's to the specific, and that specific is there. It's this quick, plain English, it follows beautifully. That, now you show, you're saying, it actually, it, it could make a reference to, you know, think about what you're saying. And I've done this miracle, hence I'm God. But even to that thought, they say that um, he must think. And to that very thought, he responds that this is an evil thought. Meaning you thinking that I am God is the evil thought. Does that, does that not mean, though, that it was okay if Jesus was just a prophet, as you say? Yes. Is it okay for him to be forgiving sins? Perhaps because it's not because he's been given authority. Note something. He doesn't say, I forgive your sins. Rather, in the holistic sense, in the generic, your sins are forgiven. Just like in John 20, 23, where the disciples are able to forgive sins. So, so, so the ability to forgive sins is one in which he has been given the authority to do so. It's not his by his own volition, you see. He does not do these things. Just like he says in John 5, 25, of my own free will, I can do nothing. So I hear as I judge, and my judgment comes from God. For I seek to do not my will, but the will of God who has sent me. He always distinguishes himself from God. Anything that he ever does, any eulogy that he, he quickly puts that down. Mark 10, 17, um, uh, Matthew 9, 3, so many other verses that I can bring, bring, down, uh, bring, bring for you as a preamble to, to that. So what we're essentially observing throughout uh, the scripture is, and I would hasten for you perhaps if you're really interested in this topic. I've just spoken to an individual a short while ago. I do a live stream on an Islamic channel called Cove FF. That's short for Coventry, C-O-V-F-F. -F. Tonight we've got a live stream, Is yeah. Jesus God? I would really request for you to come on. We've got Catholics, Unitarians, Protestants, all coming, yes, you, all coming on. You will love it. If you're really interested in this topic, very interested. Yeah, yeah. come on tonight. If you want to perhaps note it down um, in, in um, Cove FF on YouTube, C-O-V space FF, Foxtrot, Foxtrot. So we'll be discussing, we do it every week as well. Um, is Jesus God? Just want to make sure you get it. Is Jesus God? I do, I do think in what you're, in what you're saying though, there's, there's, because there's a lot of things that I've, I've got it in my notes. It's, okay. It's good. Um, there's a lot of cases where Muslims point out things that Jesus does as a human being. And I completely agree that he says that he was given authority to do those things. Even at the end of Matthew's Gospel, it says all authority in heaven on earth has been given, has been given to me. I, I, I'm not entirely sure 
I, I go from, okay, he says he's been given authority, therefore he's just a prophet, to then him making a claim like all authority in heaven on earth. And as the apostles picked up, sorry, the apostles picked up that he has then been raised to the highest place. I mean, we haven't even talked about the death and resurrection yet, which I know that you're on the uh, nice. Yes. Um, but it, it, it seems very strange that God would give a prophet that level of authority. And you're saying that he's the Messiah. Messiah, my understanding, is the anointed king fulfilled in the one who is king over all. Which again is why I, was, I mentioned Daniel 7, you've got the Son of Man. Yes. Who approaches the Ancient of Days and is given all authority and power. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. So they... I'm, not, I'm not sure that's a, that's a prophet alone who has that. I agree Jesus was a prophet, but that's... See, I'm, by him approaching, yeah, him approaching the ancients of days, that means that's God Almighty, in the effect, the Father, the Father yeah. yeah. So that even in there, there's a distinguishment between the two, you see. Ah, the, the, that the he has to come. Sorry, I cut you off. That's sorry. fine, no, go ahead, please. No, no, sorry, I shouldn't use that. That's fine, that's fine. I think I did a couple of times, so I apologize for that as well. But there's a subtle, there's a quite a, a distinction because it's the reference is made from Mark chapter 14, verse 62, in conjunction with Daniel chapter 7, verse 14, which is the inference which has been made. So in that particular understanding, the Son of Man, According to most, well, a number of Christian scholars, they, they come in three different avenues. The Son of Man could be referred to in Christ for himself, which is determining from the context. It could be referred to in a generic sense. It can be referred to in, a, in, in other senses as well. So these are like a ubiquitous titles, but it never carries any title of divinity. The fact remains that when Muslims, for example, like to quote, like in Mark 12, 28, where Christ is approached by the, te by the rabbi and says, um, what is the greatest of, 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 of commandments or rabbi? And he says, Hear thou Israel, your Lord God, the Lord is one. He doesn't say, by the way, I'm one with that God. And one more thing for you to really consider deeply. We know in the Old Testament, God is not averse to telling everybody who he is and gives grave warnings to those who associate with him. Deuteronomy 6, 4, so many other passages which you're aware of. But it does seem rather odd to me that such an elevated claim that you're claiming to be God, it should be left in no doubt whatsoever because this is a tremendous claim you're making. It shouldn't be left to derive the claim or to yeah. imply the claim. That's, that doesn't make any sense. When I, when I read my Bible, I'm left in no doubt. <laughs> you're left in no doubt, super. I'm left in no doubt. <laughs> okay, no, but, but I'm saying to you, but you did say with due respect that Mark is building up to it. I mean, I'm, I'm just paraphrasing you. It's like essentially building up within the portfolio yeah, yeah. of his Gospels to give you an image to really consider who this particular chap is. But you're quite right. See, the elevated understanding of the Gospel writers was that they believed that Christ was just like, and the best way to describe it I've ever heard, is Superman. Clark Kent, working in the metropolis, telling everybody to be good, do good things, okay? Um, acting in a prophetical way. And then when the need comes, he actually becomes a semi-divine being by stripping off his uh, shirt and becoming Superman and going into the heavens. Transfiguration Trans is similar. <laughs> but, the point, yeah. but the point being uh, is essentially that um, um, this is how they saw these individual elevated beings who would be referred to as sons of God. Because in the milieu that Christ lived in, the, um, the uh, Jewish understanding of a son of God differed considerably from the, uh, from the um, Hellenistic world that yeah, Christ lived in. Well. Like in Matthew chapter 5, yeah. verse 9, which I always find bemusing how our Christian friends seem to literally understand that one who is, a, if Christ is son of God, hence he must be the literal son of God. But this is just a ubiquitous title defined in Matthew 5, 9, yeah. blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Because the ubiquitous title for those who represent God carries no divine connotation whatsoever certainly within the preamble of the, new, of, the, of the Old and New Testament. So what we're essentially observing is I believe very firmly and I would hasten for you for this evening to come onto the show. You can speak to Unitarians who are very well versed on these particular topics. But we also, we're being very fair, I've got Trinitarians from all over the world as well. We've got Catholics who, as you know, hold that same type of uh, the, um, creedal theology, um, although obviously they differ somewhat in your Protestant um, understanding. But please come on, you're going to love it. It's, it's done in a really respectable way, very, very um, capable people, and you will learn tremendously. And I will learn tremendously. Wait, I, May I offer I, you a Quran I, as a parting I, gift, please? I've actually got one. I'm two thirds of the way through. Super. It, Do, we're here every Saturdays, two yeah. o'clock to eight o'clock. you would be very welcome to come Mustafa. again. Mustafa, yes. Nice Still, I can speak to you, my friend. Well, I'll go for my iPod. I'd love to chat more. Cove FF. Cove FF. Please don't forget, I'll be really looking forward to you coming. Take care, mate. Thank you. Take Bye -bye. care. Thank you. Nice, a very delightful conversation with a very pleasant Christian. The type of people we want to speak to, people got you know, the capability to reflect, to consider, to have a deep discussion. Not like our friends over here with due respect to them who just like to holler and shout a more uh, uh, 
a discussion based upon content rather than just emotion. So we encourage people, inshallah, to come onto the stream tonight. Cove FF, inshallah, tonight. I know you don't want to hear that, bro, but that's the fact. You've got to invite people to Islam. So Cove FF tonight, 9 p.m., live stream, Is Jesus God? Please come on. SubhanAllah. Okay.